If your birthday happens to be this weekend, then from all of us here in my living room, which I guess includes my vase and my plant, happy birthday. I would have baked you a cake had I known, but I didn't, so it's not my fault. I do want to spend some time today saying happy birthday to what I think is one of the most important, most influential media formats that ever went extinct, Betamax. If you or your parents ever had a stack of video cassettes at home, they were probably VHS tapes, but Sony's Betamax beat VHS to the market by a year, and it helped to usher in a new age of video consumption and recording. And it all began on May 10th, 1975, when in Japan, Sony released the LV-1901 Color TV console, the very first Betamax VCR. The Sony Betamax. Its only purpose is to serve you. That also just happened to come in this weird wooden box with a 19 inch television attached to it. Now, I don't think this thing looked great even by 70s standards, but the implications were huge. Whether you were watching a pre-recorded film or something that you recorded yourself, this was the first time that people in large numbers didn't have to be beholden to someone else's programming schedule. Yes, there were commercially available video formats that sort of promised the same thing before Betamax, including one called Uvision that was largely developed by Sony. But Betamax represented the first time that video cassettes really broke out of that early adopter and enthusiast niche. And that scared some people. There were two serious threats to Betamax's existence. And let's start with the one that you might not be super familiar with. Universal Studios sued Sony in 1976 over concerns that this random Japanese electronics manufacturer was producing a device that on the surface seemed tailor-made for copyright infringement. The U.S. District Court for the Central District of California eventually ruled in Sony's favor, saying that using one of these machines to record whatever, basically, for non-commercial purposes fell under fair use guidelines. The case was appealed by Universal, and that second appellate court reversed that lower court's decision, essentially finding that Sony's Betamax machines did contribute to copyright infringement in some way, and suggested that Sony pay damages to these studios. Mind you, this is despite the fact that TV producers like Mr. Rogers himself issued statements in support of Sony and supporting the continued use of these kinds of machines. Eventually, the Supreme Court had to get involved, and after hearing arguments in January 1983, the highest court in the land decided almost exactly a year later that while Betamax machines could be used for copyright infringement, they had significant non-infringement uses, like time shifting or watching your recorded content at a later time. So, Sony survived a trip to the Supreme Court, and in doing so, cemented the role of the VCR and video recording in our culture, not to mention cleared a path for devices like the DVR, which you might be literally using every day. In the living rooms of the 70s and 80s, and I guess to some extent the early 90s too, Betamax butted heads with another foe that it just could not overcome, the VHS tape. JVC spearheaded work on the VHS format in the early 70s and launched the first VHS home machine in Japan in 1976, just as Sony was getting sued in the United States. Now, Betamax was widely seen as being the technically superior format, but even now there's debate to how much of that is really true. I mean, in the earliest days of the Beta VHS war, Beta recordings had a marginally higher resolution of 250 horizontal lines per screen. That's compared to 240 that you'd get out of a VHS tape. Then again, considering the relative quality of screens and TVs at the time, I have to wonder how much of a difference those extra 10 lines actually made. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to build up a collection of Betamax and VHS tapes, plus the required recorders and players in time for this video, so I personally cannot say for sure which one was better. If you have used both in the past, please weigh in in the comments. I would love your take. And if you're looking for what probably is the best comparison you'll find in 2020, my favorite YouTube channel, Technology Connections, has an excellent comparison for you to take a look at. In the end though, all of the real or perceived technical advantages that Sony might have had didn't amount to much because it misread the moment and the masses. These beta tapes were more compact and arguably produced more faithful recordings, but you could only squeeze 60 minutes of footage onto a single Betamax tape. That means if you were recording a movie or, I don't know, a baseball game, you'd probably have to reach for a second tape about halfway through. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, you could store up to two hours of video on a VHS tape without too much fuss at all. And you could get even more out of a single tape if you didn't mind your video quality taking a hit. We're talking four plus hours here. And unlike Sony, JVC very broadly licensed the VHS standard to basically anyone. So anyone could develop and sell a VHS VCR, which meant more competition and ultimately lower prices for you and me, or I guess our parents more likely. In 1988, Sony started producing VHS players and recorders of its own, and Betamax started its long fade into obscurity. And I do mean long fade. Betamax as a format lasted far longer than I think a lot of people would give it credit for. Sony produced its last Betamax hardware in 2002, but it kept churning out Betamax cassette tapes until 2016. Now, considering that Sony developed this format while the Watergate scandal was unfolding, I'd say Betamax had a pretty good run. Now, since this is Sony we're talking about here, the Betamax was far from the last time that it tried to introduce a flashy new media standard that just kind of failed to take over the industry. After working with Philips in the early 1980s to develop the audio compact disc format, Sony took another stab at redefining the personal audio experience in the early 90s with the mini disc. These optical discs were obviously a lot smaller than CDs and they were housed in little plastic cases, so they were much more durable than CDs too. They also held the same 74 minutes of music, which took some doing on Sony's part, but we'll get to that in a second. The important thing is that while the music from a mini disc didn't sound as good as what you'd get out of a proper full size CD, mini discs sounded way better than cassettes. The mini disc format was absolutely huge in Japan and it found some degree of success in Europe too, but it was basically a non-starter in the US. I mean, I think growing up I knew maybe one person who had one, two on the outside. Still, these things stuck around for years. I mean, Sony made its last mini disc players in March 2013, just over 20 years since the format was introduced. Right alongside the mini disc was Sony's proprietary audiophile format, A-Track. This lossy compressed encoding is how Sony got 74 minutes of pretty good sounding audio onto a disc much smaller than a typical CD. For better or worse though, Sony stuck with it for a long time, like well into the age of the MP3. Even as early MP3 players started to pick up steam in the late 90s, Sony refused to accept that format entirely. Its first solid state music players, which debuted at the very end of 1999, played A-Track files exclusively. And you could get those by converting your existing music collection by either pulling from CDs or converting waves to A-Track or buying A-Track files straight from Sony's Connect Music Store, which is a thing that I do not miss in the slightest. Even as Sony moved on to hard drive based music players to better compete with the iPod, that A-Track only limitation stuck around for a while. Sony eventually embraced the MP3 and discontinued its support for 8-Track in 2007, and frankly, it was a long time coming. And then there was the memory stick, Sony's proprietary solid state memory card format. If you had a Cybershot camera or a PSP in the early 2000s, you almost certainly remember these things. It might just be me, but I remember them always being quite a bit more expensive than whatever the comparable SD or XD card was at the time, so my young, broke self just sort of naturally hated buying these things. What I love about these formats, with the exception of perhaps the memory stake, is just how stubborn Sony was with all of them. The company went out on a limb to deliver what it thought people wanted, and despite consumer attention drifting in other directions, Sony just kept plugging along, they thought they were right, and there's something respectable in that. Betamax was arguably the first and best example of this mentality. By the time Sony stopped producing Betamax hardware, it was only making like 3,000 players a year, and those were all going to Japan. It was solely for the nichest of niche audiences. Lots of other media formats have sprung up over the years to fight for our collective attention, including DivX discs and HD DVDs, perhaps most recently, but they quietly disappeared without leaving so much as a dent in our culture. It might have faded from the public consciousness already, but Betamax helped shape the way that we interact with media and helped legally protect the ways that we do it. Wishing it a happy birthday is really the least we can do. If you have 
any experience, if you have stories about being a Betamax person growing up or living life through the thick of the Betamax VHS wars, we would love to hear about it. Please leave your feedback and your stories in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate your continued support, even as we're all just hunkered down at home and I'm going insane and I'm wearing a hat because I cut my hair and it's not great. Anyway, I'm rambling now. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you again real soon. Stay tuned. Thank you.